YouTube, what up? We live. Another Monday, y'all. Happy to be here. Blessed to be here. Shout out to everybody that's here with us. The family's coming in. They're piling in. What's going on? What's up? What's up? First Monday in October. September was a rough Fourth one. Fourth quarter. <laughs> it's officially it's begun. Fourth quarter run. It's a new run. It's time to, time to make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. Let's let the Brody in. This is where you make your money. Everybody knows that you perform in the fourth quarter. Clutch performers perform in the fourth quarter. Like Kobe, like Mike. This is where legends are made. First three quarters don't count. You got to put up the points. <laughs> what will you do? You got to yes. put up the points. What quarter will define you? Like Kobe fourth. in the fourth. Like Kobe in the fourth. Ian, what's good, man? Man, how y'all feeling? Feeling good, man. Glorious. What, what parts of the world are you in now? I am back in Houston. Uh, oh, man. Home. Yeah. How's that <laughs> Home. Serenity. Such an unusual good. place these days. Good to be home. Good <laughs> to be home. <clears throat> how y'all feeling? Glorious. Glorious. Magnificent. We blessed, man. And, ab and abundant. God is good. We are blessed. All the time. Um, so are we all in a playful mood. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. We got a jam packed show today. Um, as always, and there's a lot to talk about. The stock market was on fire today. So we'll see if that was a, a one time one and done situation or a, a start to a trend for the end of the year. Who knows? We'll talk oh, about it. We're going to call it a Calipari. We'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Hey. Uh, Elon Musk is putting out robots. That is a fact. Ah, man, it's a lot. It's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, so before we start, um, you want to talk about our good friends at Ally? Ah, yeah, yeah. We'll just go there. Let's do that, man. I want to <laughs> let you know about a great choice if you're looking to bank or invest. Ally is a, digital, a leading digital financial service company with passionate customer service, innovative financial solutions, and is relentlessly focused on doing it right for both customers and our communities go with allies so you can save, invest, and spend on the things that matter most to you. For everything we need, we'll be off with an ally. Shout out to the good folks at Ally. Shout out to the whole city of Detroit. Shout, shout, out, shout out to my brother Ken. He's starting his uh he's on a vegan fast right now. Okay. Hey, shout out to the yeah. guy. Shout out to Ken. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Sersky. Um <clears throat> tomorrow, tomorrow, big episode for Earn Your Leisure. Shout out to La Russell. Hey. The hottest, the hottest unsigned artist out there right now. He not signed? Independent, independent. Yo, special man. Yeah, so that's a whole story right there because he's not he he's independent on purpose. He's been offered deals, but he's he's maintaining his independence. Extremely smart dude, man. We had such a great conversation, classic conversation. Like he's so intelligent with his business model. He has a thing where you pay whatever you want. The so, real, yeah, real it, proud to pay. Yeah, his shows, his shows, his merch. His music, there's no price for it. You pay whatever you want. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's brilliant. So and, and he explained it. He explained it. Um, and I'm telling you, you gotta watch it. Like if you're into it's not just for music people. If you're into marketing, if you're into entrepreneurship, if you're into selling things, if you're into building a brand, this is an episode to watch because his approach to how he's building his brand and how he's building his company and how he's building his his um his music structure. Is is unbelievable, it's and, game, and it's working. It's game changing. It's game changing. It's it's. I called him one of the best disruptors we've ever sat down with. Like his level mm. of genius is. I mean, it's infectious to be around. Man, he's just he's just a special a special young man, a special talent, and he can spit. Man, he could really rap, which is which is dope. But uh, he's like you want to talk about grassroots. Like he's doing it in his own grass, like in the back of his That's house. Fire. He's going throwing shows, <laughs> and he's like I said, he's he's a raw talent. But his mind is is what really is intriguing because his story it goes back. I think he was he was studying like like SpaceX, like he was studying NASA or something. Mm. So this is just a, a brilliant mind that actually found an outlet through music to be creative. And I'm telling you, it's one of them ones, man. He's, Top fifteen he, interview. It's up there. Oh, both of y'all beaming. It's yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, interview, I but wait. even more so, like person. And he gave a performance at the end too. That was the great thing is like put in perspective. His album came out, and he sold. Um, so he had like the the nip thing where they sold like physical copies as well. I think it drops this week. 
Is it? No, it's, he's he sold. It's, it dropped last week. Okay, His okay. manager told me okay. he sold over eleven hundred albums in twenty four hours, um, with people paying up to a thousand dollars per album. So to put it in that, and put it in perspective, during that last week, pure sales, no streams. Beyonce sold thirty three hundred. Bad Bunny sold eleven hundred. The baby sold four hundred. Um, and he did he did eleven hundred in twenty four hours. So he's the on to baby something. Baby did four hundred physical. Oh, we ain't gonna talk about the baby. Uh, Joe Button, Joe Button. You see, you see that? Shout out Joe. And you ain't see that. Prayers for surf. You ain't see that? You ain't see yeah. that? I saw it. I definitely. Yeah, saw it. we ain't gonna talk about the baby, but uh, he said I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. Yeah, Joe Joe Button has some some very uh strong words. <laughs> he has some strong words. Hot take, King. Shout out to my guys. Yes. Yeah, yes. shout out to you, man. Shout out to your episode. Yeah, yeah. It's Patreon. It's on. It's on. It's out right now. Yeah, it's on Patreon. A part two came out today. Uh, okay. And at the end, ask him a great question. We'll get to it later. I know he's an introvert, not in starlets, but <laughs> 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 yes, sir, we yes, have all sir. the entertainment you need on stage. If y'all, you know, yes, sir, ski. Um, all right, so let's get into this show. Before I, I, I um open up the floodgates, I just want to you know make an announcement. If you haven't got your ticket for Market Mondays at Madison Square Garden, you're doing yourself a tremendous disservice because we got some big announcements that we're about to make in the next couple of weeks and that will um, fluctuate the price. Yes. Trust me. Um, but Ian, if he wasn't around last week, Ian is doing a special deal for anybody that comes to Market Mondays at Madison Square Garden. And it is, uh, this is it. The Stock Club Call, four sessions. So you get four Stock Club Call sessions. Um, you get four entry points for long-term stocks, four crypto for swing trades mm -hmm. um, and for crypto swing trades and one live trading call with Ian and Dream Team Trading Room. You get to enter into a raffle for a one-on-one -on -one session with Ian. You get to access into a new Cypher program being released in 2023 with five new trading strategies. Discount, 50% discount on the uh, uh, Red Panda Rebellion Varsity Jacket. You get slides from the, the live show um, with 19 trading secrets during the recession. Um, Free ticket to Red Panda Trading Seminar in 2023. And you get to hang out with him one day in New York or LA to be determined in March of 2023. Four iPads will be given away. Um, merch will be given away. And um, also one person will be selected for mentorship for one year. And keep in mind, as I said before, the ticket price is actually averages at $79. Which is insane. So 1127 Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. Market Mondays live, be there. Be there. Yeah. A night to remember. Yeah, we told that to the Russell. He was like, "I got a new, I got a new, something new I want to discuss with y'all, man." So, mm -hmm. be there, man. Eleven twenty-seven. We 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 dropped some picks. The announcements are gonna be out of this world. Y'all already know how we do, man. When we say something and we holding it back, it's because it's gonna be something super, super spectacular, super special. Anytime we get to do something, you know, that's the case. We gotta make it super special. But the fact that it's in New York. Yeah. Extra special, extra special, extra special. More sauce on it. Um, all right. You want to go and to as soon as I hit that stage, you guys know I'm gonna be in La Russell fashion. Well, I know he helped y'all get the bag. I'm gonna drop the bag when y'all on stage. So get be there the early. Bag. Get to the front row. Shout out to <laughs> top row. I got something planned for y'all too, though. Shout out to the top row, Houston. What up? So our content uh, is intended to be used and must be used for informational purposes only. I know this is the disclaimer, y'all. It's very important to do your own analysis before making any investment based on your own personal circumstances. You should take independent financial advice from a professional in connection with or independently research and verify any information that you find on our show and wish to rely upon, whether for the purpose of making an investment decision or otherwise. This is a message brought to you mm -hmm. by the good brothers at Earn Your Leisure and the good brother Ian Dunlap, the master investor himself. Yes. Please. Continue to do the research, can continue to share good research. And what is really good, you know, help out other people out. That's that's how we grow as a community, man. That everyone helps the next one. Appreciate y'all. Love is love. Yes, sir. And any announcements? Do not remix, share, repurpose, or remix my information. I am for the community, for the culture, but the IP is mine. Um, if you are tired of losing in the stock market and tired of buying at the tops and falling apart in ARC funds, Come join the stock club. They can put the link in bio uh, or you can go to joinredpanda.com. The JP Morgan event will be October 8th and there will be a free two hour session. Shout out to Nicole and the good people over at JP Morgan. Um, Going to be happy to be in Philly. Shout out to my guy, Drew. And let's have an amazing show. Yeah, so we have a guest today. Steve Leisman from uh, 
CNBC Squawk Box, <laughs> uh, financial journalist, economist. It's going to be a very, very powerful conversation. But before we bring him on, I wanted to just talk about a few things that's actually currently happening in, in the market today. So if you didn't know, if you wasn't watching, the Dow Jones finished 765 points up for the day. <laughs> Uh, NASDAQ finished 239 points up for the day mm. and the S&P finished 92 points up for the day. So, um, it's interesting because, uh, September is usually a down month in the stock market. It was down. October is usually a, a good month in the stock market, especially during midterm election years. We spoke about this mm -hmm. before, um, October to April is actually the best months for stock market historically during midterm election years. Um, but obviously there's a lot of different variables that go into play this year. So is this the start of a run or is this just a pump fake? Um, Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be the test. So historically, the market tends to go up on Mondays and Fridays. If we have a strong Tuesday and a strong Wednesday, it'll be a sign of strength. If we fall Tuesday morning, turn to CNBC before the market opens and see what the futures are set to do. If they're saying that we're down 100 points before the open, won't be good. Um, but Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be the test. I hope this is the start of a strong push, but we're not here to hope. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday will be the truth teller if we're going to go up or not. Yeah, I think it's tough to tell, right? Because the, the fact is that uh, causing an economic downturn haven't really changed, right? Inflation's still here. There's still a crisis uh, in Ukraine. China's still in COVID lockdown. Those things haven't changed. Um, yeah. And so it's interesting when, when they say October and we spoke about it before, but they, they call it, I heard, I saw it in the headlines today, the, the bear killer. And so like, th these are the statistics that they're going off of. And this is actually in um, the stock traders or Mac. So uh, out of the 12 post war world two bear markets that have ended in October. So that's 1946, 1957, 1960, 1962, 1966, 74, 87, 90, 98, 2001, 2002, and 2011. All of those bear markets have ended in October. Seven of those years were midterm elections. So obviously we know that we're in one right now. Um, yeah. So in the midterm October, since 1950, the Dow has been up 12 out of six, 12 out of the six years. So been up 12, been down six on an average increase or appreciation of 2.6%. The S&P in that same time from 1950 during a midterm October, has been up 13 times, been down five with an average appreciation of 2.7%. And the NASDAQ obviously started in 1971, has been up nine times, been down three. So the numbers point in our favor for the month of October mm -hmm. and the average appreciation is 3.1%. Just want to add that in there. But the economic factors that have caused it haven't really changed. So haven't changed at all, yeah. Could it be a pump fake? Yeah, this is, I, I feel pump fake, um, but perspective <laughs> the is Kobe. Key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Traders, yeah. be careful. Be careful. Do not, because we had a great day today, go in tomorrow and be like, hey, I'm just going to do calls and I'm going to trade the NASDAQ and ES to the upside. Let it play out in front of you. Um, and going to your point, I was looking right before we started to show, inflation in Turkey has went up 83%. That's the reported number. The real number is like 185%. It's not like... All my crypto people, if I ever say anything bad about Bitcoin or Ethereum at any point, this is the ultimate case for definitely needing a hedge for international global inflation. That is terrifying. Like, imagine if you're a parent of two and you have to provide housing, clothes, shelter, if things go up 200% in two months. At one point, Zimbabwe had like 10,000% inflation. That like it was like a million dollars for a piece of bread. Um so we'll see. We'll see how the situation unfolds. History is on the side of a of a bull run. Mm -hmm. History is with us. Um but this is unprecedented times that we're in. So we will see, but it did it did kick off the way mm -hmm. that it would you would think it would kick off yeah. historically. For the fourth quarter, yeah. For the fourth quarter, fourth quarter run. Uh, a few things are in the market's favor. History, the midterm election situation, mm -hmm. the month of October, mm -hmm. and the fourth quarter. Because usually towards the end of the year, the stock market does better. So, so yeah. what are you about to say? 
So remember, like when Ghost threw Kanan in the building and he caught on fire, but Kanan survived. That's what the mark is gonna do. Like it's gonna make it out alive, but it's gonna be terrifying. Um, it's gonna be tough for a little for a little bit of time. I hope that we push up, but it's gonna 2023 is probably gonna be flat at best. And I can't wait till Steve comes on so we can talk about Fed fund rates and all that kind of stuff. But we will push up, but it's gonna be a hell of a battle to get out of this uh danger zone that we're in. Let's talk about Tesla. So Elon Musk debuted, uh, well, show showcased Optimus, um, which is Tesla's robot, mm -hmm. last week at Tesla's AI Day. Um, and the idea of this robot. So, from my understanding, the robot will be will have a cost of twenty thousand dollars, and it is designed to do everything that a human brain can do, such as process vision data make last minute decisions as well as communicate. Um, so it's pretty much like a, a person. Um, <laughs> and at $20,000, that's extremely affordable. Um, so how, it, to, how, how <laughs> to play God's advocate? Well, I got to get to it before TikTok does it. I, I think it's extremely affordable as far as like, if I, if I'm, let's say I'm using this to, as a, to somebody that's working in a factory, right. To replace yeah. a job. Yeah. It costs a lot less to pay for a twenty thousand dollar robot than it does to pay somebody sixty thousand dollars a year, and then pay for sick leave, and then benefits. pay for medical benefits, yeah. and then pay for life insurance stuff like that, which mm -hmm. end up probably being a hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. that's what I mean. It's affordable. When I'm assuming most people that have these robots are gonna be, they're gonna be using these robots for for jobs, right? Yeah. So twenty thousand dollars, you can't really hire somebody for twenty thousand dollars. No, not in the states. Not in the, not in America. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I mean by affordable. Um, but th their stock price was down today. Yeah. So wh what's the deal with Tesla? Uh, so the delivery numbers came in um, and it said they, they sold fewer than expected vehicles in the third quarter due to logistics hurdles with slowing outlook for economic growth, raising doubts about demand. So how bad do people still want the Tesla vehicles? Um, they slid down 9% after hours today, which mm -hmm. is interesting because that other company that we used to like destroy, uh, Rivian, uh -huh. they, their uh, numbers actually went up 6%. They actually, I think they delivered like 7,600 vehicles, which is a little bit more than what they expected. But I think it's interesting, right? They probably saw the forecast for that coming out on Monday. And that news came out during the weekend, right? The the robot thing. I felt like that yeah. dropped like Friday. And so let, let's let let's create our narrative. Like, let's get ahead of, <laughs> let's get ahead of the news and the, the report that we know is coming. Let's give them some breaking news. That they can run with because the numbers are going to be disappointing and um you know from an investing standpoint do we still love tesla still love it but you know there's setbacks um and this is why i said like when we're talking about is it a pump fake like these are the, some of the economic factors that are still in place that are happening yeah. to good companies um I, I think the robot uh idea is fascinating i think earlier this year or late last year um i had a stat of that by 2030 50% of the workforce will be replaced by automation in some format. Who better to bring this initiative in? And someone should research homework assignment if they are getting government funding to push this initiative through Tesla and through Elon. Um, as far as the demand for cars, the long-term demand would be great, but we are just, and I can't wait till they announce it so we can just like rip the bandaid off and just say that, hey, we're in a global recession. It's probably gonna take two or three years to recover. Um, so we can begin to fix some of the, the issues that we have been facing. Um, for the first time in a long time, man, I'm going to Tesla. Um, you going in? 130.79 is a place to load the boat. No, no, it never did. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm like, wait, where are we going with that? I should have... Yeah. Should have drug it out for like a hot take, but <laughs> um, but no, 13079 is where I'm looking to load the boat. If it does fall that far, I'll be incredibly elated. But long term, uh Tesla's gonna be fine for sure. Yeah, I like I like that you said the, the short term effect. Uh, because one of those things we had spoken about it about six months ago when we saw California um uh, make it mandatory that uh zero uh emission cars will be banned by 2035. Mm -hmm. The state that we are in, the proud state of New York, has also joined the initiative to make sure that there are zero emission vehicles by 2035. And so mm -hmm. if you know that, 
when you talk short term and we talk about, well, then that must mean that we're moving into the EV space as a state and California, New York usually set the precedent for what's going to happen nationwide yeah. for most, for the most part, obviously he's building a plan in Texas. So I'm sure they'll join on board at some point. Who's the leader in that space? Ding, ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. Our robot, here we come. <laughs> Car, robots. It's going to be interesting, man. Um, we are literally going through like a change in the guard economically. And the more data that comes out, the more terrifying it can be. But for everyone that is listening, um, please pick the four companies that you love dearly. Buy them at the rock bottom prices that you can. And for everyone who missed out on 2020, you get a chance to get in probably at 2019 to 2018 prices when it's all said and done. I think we'll start to bottom out probably by end of year and push up but it's going to be a turbulent takeoff to the upside yes hit the like button please hit the like button 4600 people hit the like button and Appreciate share hit the like button and share um shout out to travis hunter yeah number one uh recruit. Yeah. yes yeah number one player in the in the country last year went to jackson state university that's fire. And was spotted in assets over liabilities. This is a fact. Today. Hey. This is a fact. Smart man. That was a legendary interview, too. Thank oh, you. Appreciate, appreciate that. that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Shout yeah. out to shout out to uh coach coach prime. Good dude. Solid. Good dude. Um, all right. So let's talk about <clears throat> let's talk about this. Let let's go here. Um Microsoft mm -hmm. was last week, it was at its 52 week low of $232. It's 52 week high was $349. Oh, so, you. you know, you always talk about people always talk about you want to invest in their 52 week low. It's at $240 now. So was the time to buy Microsoft last week? Do you see Microsoft as a company that's now on the uptick? And why did Microsoft fall so much when Apple didn't really fall that much. Apple fell, but it didn't. It didn't fall to the fifty-two week yeah. low. Yeah, Apple. What did it get down to? One forty. What was this low? One thirty-seven. Yeah, one thirty-seven. Yeah, and it was peaked at what? One eighty. Got up pretty high. It's peak for the year. Yeah, one eighty. One eighty-two. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's a it's a huge pullback. Is it a good time to buy Microsoft? I mean, somebody. It's the same question I get. Like, if somebody asked me, "Is it a good time to buy Apple?" I'm like, yes. Yes, it's it's always a good time. In fact, I've added mm -hmm. to my my kids' uh, custodial accounts mm -hmm. with with Apple, with Microsoft, and uh, with Google. I think Google got under a hundred dollars, so I was like, all right, well, this is my time. Yeah, yeah it, I, I mean, I don't, I don't like what Ian just said. Like, find the four companies that you love and want to keep long term. Mm -hmm. We've said this for two and a half years, three years now. Microsoft is one of them. Yeah, Ian, I, I mean. You can hold up the, the emojis there, right? Like those are those are the Cooked two. Put that up, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if some interesting stats on Microsoft, if you look at all versions of Windows, Microsoft has seventy five percent of share in the desktop in the desktop operating system market. That is not going to change. The truth of, of why Apple fell and Microsoft fell, like to put it very clear, the economy is damaged. I'm not going to say beyond repair. But this is the most critical state that we've been in in a long time. And I would argue even worse in 2008. So as the market is being pushed down, everyone has so much fear. And that's why the dollar's risen so much. Everyone's like, let me just go to cash. I don't know when this is going to end. I don't have Ian's crystal ball. He won't sell me a license to it. So I don't know when the market is going to bottom out. <laughs> let me just put my money underneath the mattress. And as long as my place doesn't catch on fire, I'll be safe. And I totally understand that. Um, but I think they have a competitive advantage as well as Apple. And I said, we could talk about it if we want to later, but also with Apple pushing into the NFC space, which could be very damaging for um, lovers of crypto, crypto and NFTs. Um, those are the two safest stocks, but, but they're falling because of, of global fear. Like if you look right now, there are not too many bright spots. Oil has come down. Commodity prices have come down. Inflation is up. Um, volatility has not hit the peak what it should yet for a reversal. So I'm looking for like $42.30 on a VIX or maybe 45 before we start to bottom out. We're just in the middle of 
an economic storm. And even though we have all the data around it, and no matter how many times I can tell you, hey, listen to Money Master the Game, read Money Master the Game, when you're in the thick of the fire, it is not fun. The only salvation that you have right now as an investor is to be able to trade short term, to be able to provide gains. And if you're a business owner, put your foot on the gas in terms of marketing and growing your business. Uh, but in the overall market, it's really scary now. Um, like I said before, it's only maybe 30 companies, maybe 20 in the S&P 500 that are worth its weight in gold. You and said four. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say you said 42 on the VIX? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. 42. Uh, 42 to 40, 45 will, will we start to turn it around. And, and, true, and I've been saying it for maybe a year and a half. We have to have publicly traded companies that innovate a lot better and a lot faster and actually create more value in the, in the marketplace. One of the things I talked about with the good folks over at Meta, meeting went well. Um, so as a result, this is going to be a changing of the guard where we actually have to produce better returns, better products, better services that are better internationally as well, and not just get endless rounds of funding. And the companies that will do that over the next five years will dominate the next 50 years. But right now, uh, this is the part of the roller coaster that's not fun to be on. Uh-huh. Yeah, 42, that, that means there's, there's some pain on the way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about this. The last question before we bring our guest on is, um, okay, why should crypto enthusiasts and NFT lovers be worried about Apple's potential plan to take over the market? And what is, what is, what is Apple planning on doing? So I know everyone always like, yo, you're Apple enthusiast. You always caping for Apple. Let me give you an alternative perspective on the not so good side. So um, Apple is going to allow developers to sell NFTs in the gaming platform mm-hmm. in the app. So hypothetically, what if they put an Ethereum wallet in every mobile game? There's a billion users on the platform. What will happen as a result? You have now have another major yeah. institution that is eating up the lion's share of that crypto space in tandem with JP Morgan owning a lion's share of it. And this isn't the time where I'm going to say, hey, I told you so. But anytime we say, hey, this is the greatest thing on earth and this is for the people, the institutions are going to find a way to say, hey, let me get a piece of that thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I- it, no, I was I was going to add to what you're saying was 100 percent right. I think most people will look at it, and most of the headlines will say, "Well, but people are going to have to pay that 30 percent uh, cut that Apple's going to pay for anybody that sells inside the app." Mm-hmm. In short term, it sounds like, "Oh, that's a problem." Most people want to do it, but when you that that piece that you said, one billion users, users. into the space, that 30 percent almost becomes like, "All right, that's just a cost to do business, right?" Because you're bringing one billion people in, mm-hmm. in crypto. You know, obviously, it's still very new, like 12 years in, but there's still people who who don't know all the effects or how to use it or what it's even meant for. If you get mm-hmm. people on an iPhone, you got 1 billion users now in that space that can purchase. They're the other part, yes. actively do it. But the, the, the interesting part is that they're going to sell the NFTs for US dollars. You don't even have to use a crypto to buy them, right? You Man. can convert that after, right? You can do it, convert it to Bitcoin or Ethereum or Solana or anyone that you want to. But you can buy it in U.S. dollars, which makes the use case even more attractive, right? Now I don't have to figure out, wait, I got to buy this and get this and put this in my wallet to purchase it. No, I could just use my U.S. dollars to purchase Mm it. The use case and the user case there, it makes it a lot more easier, which makes more people even intrigued to get in. So that means it it will be beneficial. For Apple, for sure. For NFTs. For for NFTs, yeah, for NFTs too. But some of those companies that are relying on those fees... (laughs) I mean, but but if it's supposed to be decentralized, like even after they get the merge, now it's six exchanges that have what sixty five percent of the distribution. Now Apple also has a a great relationship with the government, and wait till the regulations come. Now during times of disaster, um, prayers to Gunner, Thug, Surf, love you and praying for you. During times of disaster and economic calamity, more charges come. So now in two or three years, they're going to push heavier crypto regulation. And you're going to start to see a lot of talk about government from our government. Is crypto an issue of national security? 
And if they wave the flag for Apple and say, hey, you're going to be our measure of safety and everything is done through you. Now you have JP Morgan, Apple and the United States government eating up majority of the crypto. And guess what? If the gains are not coming from iPhone 14, when Steve Jobs daughter said it's no better than 13, you don't think they won't run to that crypto market and get it there? It's tough, man. I know everyone said last year, I didn't know. And then here we are, JP Morgan. Mike, go ahead, Apple, US government, military, game set match. So, but but it is beneficial though. For Apple. There's no different than Universal owning all the masters to and, and back when Lior was at Def Jam. And it was, yeah, it was beneficial for Murder Inc. to have a label deal. And Lior ended up with everything and went to 300 in YouTube. Well, I think it's like um it's kind of like when crypto, um, when Fidelity is starting to let crypto and, and 401ks and different it's beneficial to crypto. Because more, it's it's more exposure, it's, it's it it legitimizes the, the space even more, and it means that it's, it's 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 even more of a case why it's here to stay. But it's more okay. So imagine if let's make up a network, ABC network. Oh, no, it, well, it's the actual ABC, XYZ network came to us and said, "Hey, we want sixty five percent of everything that you do content wise, but we'll give you legitimacy. Will we take that deal?" I would say no. It's the same thing. So now if we have seven major players and it may, of course, give legitimacy to it and it may make the overall market cap larger, but there is not decentralized and not for the people. And it's not a tool of liberation. Well, it's I think be- the, the idea of decentralized is a pie in the sky. The wealthy control everything. Last wealthy- year, no one was saying that, though. Is that me? And I was getting killed. Well, who the, the wealthy always control everything. Last year, they controlled the NFT market last year. Facts. So, you know, it's never going to be a situation where it's e- it's the great equalizer and it's the poor man's way to wealth. Like once people see that this is a viable option, you know, the rich are going to control it. Powerful institutions, banks, hedge funds, mm-hmm. they're going to control it. They controlled it last year. They control it this year. Yes. But. Before we go off on a debate topic, let's get our esteemed <laughs> guests in here to have a high level conversation. Hit the like button, 5,600 people on YouTube. Let's get this up to 6,000. Hit the like button and share. Yeah, Sersky, where would you rather be on Monday night than here? <laughs> Greatest show on earth, ladies and gentlemen. In two years, you guys are going to be glad you listen to this information. It's going to be life changing. I promise you. Oh, there live, live from the studio. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> working late. Working late or working, working early. Working late. I appreciate on, you. On a Monday as usual. There he goes, the legend himself. Steve, how's everything? I couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. I, I, I could be in my home studio or I could be in the studio studio. I'm not going to say. Ah, uh, okay. 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 Either way, we got you here. Gotcha. I got a little thing going, so I could be anywhere. But uh, I got a TV and some lights and a camera, so I'm good to go anywhere. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I appreciate. Either you. way, either way, it does it. Well, first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. It's a real pleasure to be here. I like the conversation at the beginning. I was taking some notes on some of that stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. We met at uh. Josh Brown's conference. Shout out to Josh Brown. Shout out to Josh. Shout good out to Josh. Love you, man. Good, good friend Future of ours. Was incredible. And um, yeah, uh, you guys connected. Yeah. And he was getting get on him on the show. And a couple weeks later, here we are. Yeah. The the see, the first connection we got to tell him is that there's this town that you're from that we know very well. <laughs> from our neighborhood. Can you, can you tell him where you're from, Steve? Can you tell him? I mean, what are the what are the odds that we're out there in Huntington Beach, California, and two guys are introduced come from Hartsdale, New York, like way back <laughs> i mean that's ridiculous so steve steve is from hartsdale which is a small village in the town of greenberg we both uh we well, the same, did we go to the same high school i think you didn't go to woodlands though right steve i i didn't go to woodlands i we moved out of uh out of hartsdale uh after that before i went to the, to the high school yeah so when we were talking about where we're from it, it he was like of course i know hartsdale of course i know where woodlands is i, I grew up over there i'm like Ah, brilliant mind, brilliant mind. Yeah, cross town, <laughs> cross town, small world. It, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, blue collar, working class guy. This is true. It makes sense. Um, all right, so let's get into this conversation. 
Um, I have a few questions that I'm sure, you know, we all are uh, eager to know. But um, first, the current state of the economy, um, you know, people are very scared right now. Inflation is high. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and that that spills over to the stock market. So what are your thoughts on the current state of the economy? I was hoping you were going to ask me to explain why the Giants are three and one or if Aaron Jones <laughs> is 52. We'll get there. Rather than the, the, soon. the economy. Um, I think the economy uh, is, is absolutely historic right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on. And we, we keep wanting to kind of shove the present into molds of histories of the past, but nothing really quite fits. Um, uh, right now, we're we're recovering from a pandemic and that process is still going on not just the one in america but globally um and you shoved a lot of money in people's pockets and they still seem to have some money to spend and so you have this uh inflation problem which is not quite as bad as we had 40 years ago in the 1980s but you do have the federal reserve raising interest rates trying to slow the economy Everything would be easy to understand as a terrible, terrible economy if we weren't, you know, doing like hundreds of thousands of new jobs every month. And that kind of gets to my other side of the story. We keep telling this one side of the story, oh, there's inflation, there must be a recession. But we, we can't be having a recession when we're doing three or four hundred thousand new jobs every month. And well, why is that? It's because the economy is still coming back from the pandemic. There we, we just, oh, about two months ago, reached the level of jobs that we'd lost in the pandemic, and we went above it. But there's still some industries like leisure and hospitality, state and local government workers, teachers in this country, nursing, um, that are well below where they are. And it's still a very, very good job market. Um, so what's happening right now is there's a lot of inflation. Some of that inflation is related to all the money that was pumped into the system, from the Federal Reserve being too easy, but a lot of it was related to supply problems that were linked to the pandemic. China was still locked down or almost is still locked down right now. Yeah. What's China? China is the factory of the world. It's the factory of the United States. So to the extent that they're locked down, we're not getting all the goods that, that people need. Yeah, it, the economy's softening, but how much it softens, I'm, I'm a little bit like I said, I'd rather discuss why the New York Giants are three and one than figure out if this economy is headed to a recession, because I'm kind of perplexed about both of them kind of equally. I can't I, I can't really figure out this Daniel Jones thing myself. But um, <laughs> <laughs> let, Let's talk about the outlook for inflation. A lot of economists um, are, are seeing it going down to six point eight percent by the end of this year. Yeah. Some projections have it at 3.6% by the end of December of 23. Sure. Obviously, the, the feds are, are raising, um, you know, basis points. So how do we get, how do we even get to 6.8? Because every time we look, it's like, all right, we're still in the eights. We're still in the eights. What's the outlook for it for the rest of this year? How are we going to get to 6.8? Well, let me make sure everybody understands what we're talking about when we talk about inflation. Inflation is the growth of prices. It's not necessarily so that when you go up, month to month or, or year to year, you've got to go up by 8% every year. If it doesn't go up anymore, that's a zero. And what we're trying to do is get to two. So we've had these big increases in prices. How do we get there? Well, we start producing more cars, put those cars on the lot. We slow down the housing market. We slow down consumer spending. Um, and we're going to have to have probably some uh, unemployment. We get the supply chains back working. And then we can get back to a more normal inflation level. And of course, the Federal Reserve has to get interest rates up to help to, to, to try to slow the economy. Um, I'm not cheerleading any of this stuff, but it's the stuff that the economists say has to have, have, have to happen in order to uh, bring inflation down. Um, I remember in 2019 when a Deutsche Bank report came out uh, and you were on air with Joss and you predicted that a global recession was going to happen um, because I think trade tensions, Brexit, and global growth slowdown. So if we do hit recession next year, what do you believe will be like the two or three catalysts that will lead us out of it safely? Um, so I think at that point, the Federal Reserve will um, will reverse course. So that'll help a lot. Uh, um, the question becomes, how much is the Federal Reserve willing to tolerate in terms of declines in growth 
before it reverses course. Um, mm. So it may be, and, and I actually have been asking this question of Fed officials for several months. And uh, just last Thursday in Cleveland, I got this answer from the Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Masters. She said, if we hit recession, we're probably going to keep hiking. Because right now at the Federal Reserve, reducing or getting inflation back down to its target level of 2% is job number one. And they're willing to tolerate a certain level of unemployment increase in order to make that happen. Right now, their forecasts are for kind of a modest increase in unemployment, but a lot of folks don't really believe that. A lot of folks think unemployment may go up quite a bit more in order to create the slack in the job market that's needed to bring down inflation. Um, I have my doubts about that. I think it's still possible to, to get away with this thing with a mild downturn and a mild increase in, in, in unemployment. And that's because I still believe in some momentum to this economy that has to do with a continued reopening. I, I don't know. I'd ask you guys, is everything back to normal the way it was before the pandemic? And, and I, my own experience is no. There's still restaurants that are closed. There's still things that are tough to get. Um, I remember when you'd go to a car lot and you'd, you'd, you'd get a dealer who cared if you walked out. And they don't care anymore if you walk out because there's not as many cars on the lots. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys may know this or not. I don't know. But when you go into a car dealer, you're not buying the car in front of you. You're buying a car that's the dealer's going to replace it with, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if there's no car in the in in the lot to replace the one you're taking, you're you have no bargaining power. But yeah. when there's a car in the lot, a car on the train on the way to the lot, a car in the factory being made that's going to get on the train to get to the lot, that's when you have the kind of bargaining power that we used to have. I went in there one time, and the guy's like. I don't know if I really want to give you the time of day because I don't know. I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to hang out and not buy a car right now because I'm going to wait till things chill out a little bit. And we did get a little bit of good news in some of the auto reports that they're kind of clearing the um, uh, some some of the uh, uh, or the lack of inventory. They're increasing inventories down the road, so so that that could get better and that'll bring down inflation. You remember one of the big uh, uh, impulses to inflation we had was used cars. Um, yeah. I went to go give my car back on lease and it was like worth $15,000 more than I paid for it mm -hmm. um, than, than the lease was. So I actually bought the car off a of lease and I told the guy, I'm not going to buy a car now. So I got to figure out whether I get new tires on my car, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the Fed uh, has continuously raised interest rates this year. Yeah. Um, do you think that it can go much higher than it is and do you think that they're doing a responsible job with this interest rate hikes every couple of months so far well i i sure wish they'd listen to what i would and many others were saying which was that they had gotten off of the easy monetary policy sooner than they did um it it's kind of inexplicable they went and they were pumping 120 billion dollars a month into the economy by buying bonds they were still at zero even when they saw that this inflation was not what they called transitory, that is, it wasn't going away real fast. And yeah. they really kept uh, uh, their foot on the, on the accelerator of the economy too long. I think given that, and the reason why I say that is because I think at this point, it is responsible for them to keep raising rates um, because they're behind the curve on this. They have to get rates up to a more normal or actually restrictive level in order to break the economy. Uh, and break, I mean, B-R-A-K-E. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's kind of like this funny debate we have, like, is the Fed going to break B-R-E-A-K, the economy, or B-R-A-K-E? That's really one of the big debates that's out there. And and they may not stop until they break it, as in, you know, a bone or something like that. But they do have to put the brakes on the economy right now to try to bring inflation. And the reason is that you know, the, the thinking is that you can't really do business when inflation is 8, 10, 12 percent a month, that you can't plan, um, you can't you can't uh, uh, really run the economy. And that ultimately, if you run inflation too hot, you guys were talking about Turkey before. Yeah. Um, Turkey is one of my favorite places because there is no better example of terrible central banking than Turkey. You guys know what happened in Turkey, right? Um, which is that the, the central bank has been 
you you gave the number before. Was it eighty three percent month yeah, over month inflation? Yeah, that's insane. So imagine, imagine. <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about here? If something cost a buck, and then it cost a buck eighty the next month. I mean, you know, uh, it, it's 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 crazy. Um, uh, uh, and and they kept uh, in reducing interest rates while they had higher inflation. And and let's go back even more recently to what happened in, in England. Have you guys had a chance to talk about that on your show? Yeah, we actually no, covered it. Covered it we last week. Talk, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Well, I'll give you I'll give you the two cents since you went over it. But if you didn't tune in last week, what happened is um, the British government came forward and said it's going to boost deficit spending. It's going to cut tax rates, and and the 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 pound the the the, the British pound the sterling. Freaked out, it low, it, it it fell to almost parity. That is one to one with the dollar. It's usually yeah. like uh, uh, a a do- a pound buys a a dollar fifty. Went down to a pound buying just a dollar. Uh, it's now up again. I'll explain that in just a second. But um, you know, uh, and and then British interest rates, um, they surged on on the news that there was going to be deficit spending. So, um, you're I'm answering the question whether or not I think what the Fed is doing responsible, and I think the reaction of markets to responsible central banking is positive uh, to the extent that if the Fed said, we're going to let inflation go, I think the market would be a lot worse than it is right now. The market's coming to terms with a very different and new reality. And that reality is interest rates for the Fed funds rate that may go up as high as four and a half or 5%. It was zero in March of 2020 uh, to so what we're living through right now is an historic moment of unprecedentedly aggressive central bank interest rate policy. Um, some people say it's irresponsible. I'll give you the other side of that story. They say the Fed is being too aggressive. The other side of that story is that the Fed is behind the curve. And the most important thing for the welfare of the most people in this country is to bring inflation under control. Because if you're working a job, and let's say you get a 5% raise, but inflation is 8%. Well, you went backwards by 3% in your standard of living. So what you're speaking about raising rates, right? There's the hike part that most people are aware of. But what the Fed is saying, from what I, I, I my understanding is that not only are they going to raise it, but they're actually going to hold it there. So even when, when inflation comes down a bit, they're going to hold it there. So can you talk about the impact that that will have and how long term will that hold? I mean, from your opinion, B. Well, we, we we do a CNBC Fed survey every time the Fed meets. So that's the Tuesday if you guys want to tune in and uh, uh, just see what, what our panel of 35 to 40 uh, economists and strategists are saying. But And right now that number is 11 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, the average respondent thinks the Fed hits the peak funds rate, which is 4.5%, and that happens sometime next spring. Uh, just so people know, the Fed is at 3.1 right now. So they're dialing in or they're forecasting another full percentage point and a quarter or so of additional rate hikes. So 125 basis points or 1.25% of additional rate hikes, which we now and say the spring of next year. And then the Fed holds there. Now, just to be fair, uh, these forecasts are almost always certainly wrong, but (laughs) it is the consensus right now of of where people are trading. Um, there, if there's if there's going to be good news uh, on inflation, uh, if inflation comes down faster, if the economy f- slows more quickly than is expected, um, then the Fed can back off sooner and do less damage to the economy. So, I think the you know, I, I love what you guys were doing at the top of the show, which is talking about individual companies and and earnings and this and this story and that story, and that's really important. Uh, but right now, a lot of the investing right now is a big macro story based yes. upon the Fed and trying to figure out the direction of inflation. I mean, the answer to all the questions you guys are asking, the direction of inflation, how high the Fed has to go, how much damage that does to the economy, how much the damage to the economy does to corporate earnings, mm-hmm. and how much all that does to unemployment. So these are the big questions. And these do the big, what you would call, I guess, beta things, the things that move all stocks together. Within that, as you guys discussed, there are individual stories. There's crypto and Apple, and there's GM, and there's Tesla, and there's Rivian, and there's a lot of great stories out there. 
Um, but but this big macro question, uh, I, I hope to not be so busy next year. I guess I could tell you that. I hope to, to that 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 what I say and do is not as significant for the movement of the market as it is right now. But that's unfortunately not the case for at least to the end of the year. Um, I have to ask, because, of course, it could be a lot worse. Um, I graduated high school in 2000. So I think at that time, the Fed fund rate was like six point five percent and eighty nine. It was nine percent. Um, you don't think we will go that high, do you, before things start to turn around? And, 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 and I just want to be completely honest. The job that the central banks have is an incredibly tough one. Um, so I want to be fair in that regard, but I do want to give our listeners a chance to brace if we do push to 4.5 and that isn't enough. How high do you think we can end up going? Well, I mean, I think the Fed will go where it needs to go to get the job done. Um, I, I think that of all the bets I would take, I would not bet against the Fed not solving the inflation problem. Um, okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I think the Fed wins that game. And the question is, how ugly does it win it? If you know what I'm saying, how, uh, how much damage does it do to the economy in the process? And, and the Fed, I mean, could go to 6% or 6.5%. <laughs> But 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 before you um you know take that cyanide pill or whatever it is you were gonna do there um, <laughs> just everybody relax a little bit. Let, let me ask some absence right now. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the thing is that um, I still think that some of the forces in the world that gave us a sustained period of low inflation, they're still out there, but they need to be able to assert themselves. Uh, in the kind of more post-pandemic world, like getting China back up and running, right? Mm, okay. Globalization was a very big and important factor that kept prices down. Um, I know that's maybe a controversial topic in America, but but the reason you're able to go to Walmart and Costco and all those places and get inexpensive things was in part because they were made in China where things were made more cheaply. Um, Apple is still making a good percentage of its iPhone product over there. Um, and, and we have been in a sort of deglobalizing world where we have begun to be concerned about things like where stuff is made, where it's come from. Uh, you guys talked earlier about the Ukraine war and how much um, uh, that is uh, uh, affecting uh, prices. You know, those things work out. The supply chain problems work out. Um you start to get inventory back in 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 into the in, into the car lots and in the back rooms of places, and then you can have a more normal pricing environment. So I don't think that stuff's gone away. Um, I think over time this will heal itself with the help of the Fed raising interest rates. But I don't think the Fed's going to have to go quite that far to, to solve this problem because the other thing that's happening is a lot of the money that was given to folks. Um, in the post uh, to help them through the pandemic, some of that savings is winding down, and that's going to also uh, help uh, reduce the rate of inflation. You spoke about um, the pound. I don't know if we, we can kind of double back on that. We're headed to London, Royal Albert Hall. We have a show there, and we have a lot of support in the UK. So, yeah, the, the dollar dropped, the pound dropped, but it's um, it's rallied. Um, so. Yeah. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Why why did it rebound? And, and what are your thoughts on on the UK what they're doing? So I'm just going to call up the chart because I was just looking at that earlier. The pound rebounded. I think it was today, right? And yeah. that's because the trust yeah, government, the new government over there, backed off their kind of uh, uh, crazy kind of profligate uh, uh, comments of doing all this amazing deficit spending and tax cuts. I think that's that's what happened. Um, and by the way, I think that that part of what happened when, when England said something is the bond trader said, well, wait a second, how great is the U.S. on this score in terms of controlling its own spending? Um, and so there was that question as to whether or not the fiscal side was going to be helpful or hurtful to the monetary side. And I hope people understand those are two separate things. The things that the central bank decides, the Fed, is independent of what Congress and the president decide when it comes to spending. They all end up as inflationary in the economy, but um, those are separate decisions that are made. Um, and so uh, that's why the pound rebounded. I, the question I just have to ask you guys is, did you plan this 
trip before the pound crashed or, yeah, or after? Totally. Because that's like the smartest thing you could do with your money is go to England right now. Uh, you know what? You know what's so crazy that you say that? It, it's, it's divine intervention. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Worked out well. And, and I just put that on Instagram. I'm like, if you've never been to England, this is the time to go. Yeah, For all the, the tourists in America, I mean... It, Good time to be there. It's, I mean, we my wife is going. Too. My wife's going next week. She had a trip planned months ago with her sister. Uh, they're going on one of those Jane Eyre tours, you know, like all those old villages and stuff like that. that she's been wanting to do for her whole life. So she's going over there. And I'm like, sweetheart, you make the best financial decisions in this family <laughs> all the time. I'm supposed to be the expert. And, and like the, the things that she's decided to do over the years, that's why we have any money at all. <laughs> you're a smart man yeah yeah <laughs> can, can we can we i, I want to talk about something that uh and if we, we you know a lot of our guests and us included watch cnbc you know pretty regularly and we always hit see treasury yields so can you talk about what what they are and the factors that affect them like we always hear and see two year five year ten year thirty year can you talk about what they are and, and again the factors that that play a role in them and affecting them so it's a great question, and 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 I love I love answering it because um, a lot of sophisticated folks don't have any idea what goes into them. They think they do, but they don't. And I've spent a lifetime trying to understand it. And um, you know, maybe I'm a little closer than I was before, but but there's still a lot to learn here. So the deal is, um, Treasury yield is is the uh, the amount of interest that you get, obviously, for owning the bond. Well, what goes into that? You know, you can kind of answer that question by asking yourself, what would you charge somebody to give them money and get paid back next year, get paid back in three years, get paid pay back in five years, or get paid back and get paid back in 10? So what does that tell you? What, what is an interest rate? An interest rate is the price that you get for foregoing or not consuming your money today. Mm. Right. So if I'm going to if I got a hundred bucks in my pocket and I give you a hundred bucks, what do I want from you so I don't spend that money today? Now, I'm going to want to be covered by inflation in the first instance. Right. So that means that there is what they call an inflation premium inside of it. I'm going to want to be covered for the risk of you not paying me back. So that's the second thing inside of it. Um, now, what is that risk with the U.S. government? Technically, we call the Treasury the risk-free rate. In other words, there's no risk that the government is not going to pay me back. We can talk about that separately at another time if you want, but generally that's how the Treasury is viewed is as the risk-free rate. Okay, there's one other thing. Well, there's a bunch of other things inside, but another main thing inside is what they call the term premium, which is how long am I going to have to forego that spending for so that I would do one year? Well, I'll charge you one rate. But if it's three years, I'm going to charge you a higher rate. Mm -hmm. Five years is a higher rate than that. And 10 years is an even rate higher than that. So what did I just do? I just did you an air chart of the uh, slope of the yield curve. It goes one, three, five, seven, ten. 2030, and it should go up like this. That's not the case right now. Right now, we have what's called a bunch of inversions inside the chart, and I'll tell you what those inversions are. What's an inversion? When a later dated treasury is yielding less than a current one. So I'll give you an example of that so you can understand it. Um, right now, the 10-year uh, is 366, but the two-year is 4.13. So the 10-year is actually yielding less than the two-year. Why is that? Because it's telling you a story of what's going on. Mm. What that's telling you is people think that the Fed is going to hike rates to a certain level over the next two years. But over time, that yield is going to come down because there might be a, a recession or because the Fed ends up uh, uh, um, solving the inflation problem and cutting rates. So right now we're in this weird inversion time. And when you guys talk about recession, one of the things that has been over time 
a pretty good signal of recession coming is an inversion of the yield curve. Yeah. Have I confused you all or? or, or no, 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 keep going. Oh, no. This is amazing. Yeah, perfect. Sense. Okay. Economics class all yeah, over again. This is, this is, this is high level. <laughs> Economics class. <laughs> like studying, studying for the CFP all over again. All right. Yeah. There's going to be an exam at the end of this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And when you're talking about the inversion, you're referring to the two and the 10 for the audience, correct? Exactly. And there's other inversions that I follow a little more carefully, which is I like the two year and the, well, which is not inverted. I like the um, the the three month and the two year, which is not inverted yet. That's yeah. the one the Fed follows. And that's one of the th reasons why the Fed is not sort of conceding that there's going to be a recession. So the three month is trading at 339, the two year at 413. So that's another uh, that's not inverted. But the, the two year is higher than the five year. It's higher than the seven year. It's higher than the whole spectrum of yields out there right now. This is not normal. As I explained, the sort of the capitalist approach is I want more for lending to you for longer, yeah. in part because another thing is the risk premium goes up. In other words, you think about it, um, if I lend it to you for a year, well, you know, you can pay me back next year, but I don't know what your situation is going to be five years from now. So I'm going to take a higher risk premium. So the the, the world sh normal slope of the curve is like this: the longer you lend money, the more you should get for lending it for the length of time. So you you've interviewed a, a variety of different people, a lot of the highest profile bankers and CEOs and different things of nature. Um, what do you get from the interviews that you do from these highly intelligent, highly successful, highly wealthy people? Like when we interview people, we always, you know, gain information from the interview. It's a great way to actually learn. So what, what are some of the insights and what are some of the things that you, you've walked away from, from some of the, you know, people that you've had conversations with? Huh, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I'm a news guy, right? So I'm always looking for what the news is. I'm always trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, what I can help my viewers with in terms of understanding where the Fed is going, what, you know, what the, how, how to think about the economy. But I guess the thing that's probably the most important thing that I get from these interviews is figuring out how people think about things, how they process information. Mm -hmm. It's, a, as you know, I mean, there's so much going on. There's so much to process. But but there are guys that I talk to that are able to, you know, drill down and see past all the confusion and all the the other stuff uh, that's out there and really help you um, uh, see things. I the, one of the things I really like about my job and 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 I have to remember is is to always be talking to people mm -hmm. and never think you really know or understand something because some you know. I've been a newspaper reporter for a long time. And then I was on, I've been on television and um, I remember once uh, having run a correction for uh, the guy who smelt, who spelled his name Smith S M Y T H E. And I didn't ask him how he spelled it. And that's kind of always been a lesson to me, which is you think you understand a process always, um, uh, always make sure you, you got the nuts and bolts, right because then a lot of other stuff falls into place. So the, the best investors I've spoken to, the best people I know um, on this stuff are able to cut through the information confusion that's out there, not get themselves wound up in, in details that don't matter, mm. um, and, and really focus on the questions in front of them rather than the questions they don't need to be spending their time on. Yeah. One of the things that you, you spoke to us about and, and Ian could contest to it was like you, having conversations is important, but I think it was the, the day uh, that we spoke, I think the the Fed meeting was going to happen uh, the next day. And you said, yeah, I got to, I got to go. Cause I got to be up by four forty five in the morning to process all the data. <laughs> and so like, we always get the question, all of us get the question what do you read? How do you, what is your research? So what's that process like for you? Cause at that point you're like, four, I'm like four forty five, man, I'm waking up at five thirty six. He's already an hour ahead of me and he's analyzing data at that time. So what is, what is that process like for you as an economist? So um, I read, you know, a couple, trying to think, there, there's some guys who are good on certain things and some who are, who are, who are good on others, but um, I'll read four or five different economic reports that kind of um, uh, show what, what the forecast is, what's expected. 
Um, I'll go back and look at the prior data. Um, I'll also kind of write down for myself what other data is similar to what's coming out because, you know, the government data, it's probably good over time, but it, it, it's just, it's not that great sometimes on a, on a high frequency basis. Um, and so, um, for example, when a jobs report comes out, it, it, it has a, a 95% confidence level of plus or minus 100,000. What does that mean? It means that, that the number, if you want to be confident that it's right, it can be plus or minus 100,000 of what they're saying it is. So if it's 200,000, it's almost definitely between 100 and 300,000, which is crazy when you think about it, because the market's going to trade on whether or not it was, if the estimate was 200, if it was 220, it's hot. If it's 180, it's low, but the confidence ban. So I'm bringing that up because what I'll go into, um, I'll go into the jobs number, which is just Friday, by the way, and the number they're looking for is 275,000. So now you guys will all know that the real confidence level on this thing is, what is it, 175 to 375. Yeah. But I'll know what the jobless claims number is. I'll know what a bunch of survey data is telling me about um, what the job market is. So that won't be the only piece of information. So this number comes out, and if it's wildly out of sample with all of the other stuff that I'm looking at, well, I'll say so on television. And I've done that before where I, I there was a November number, I think in 2021 that came out really low. And I said, there's no way that that is accurate. I think it was something like it came out at 200,000. And I said, that can't be true. Um, and that number was subsequently revised up to six or 700,000 after it came out. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's really important to kind of know everything that's going on in the economy and for stuff to kind of fit into a general idea that you have of, of how things are going. The other thing that's been really interesting and, and, and it really energizes me is that there's a whole bunch of new uh, private sector high frequency data that's been coming out um, that's now available. The hedge funds are looking at this. Um, you can all look at this. We've been reporting more of this, but there are now companies that, um, for example, they provide human resources software to uh, uh, like tens of thousands of companies. And they're now providing us with what that says about the employment uh, levels that are going on out there. Uh, there's credit card data on a high frequency basis. JP Morgan is putting out now. Um, the Federal Reserve is using this kind of data when, when there's a hurricane uh, in a certain place like there was. The Fed can look at what's happening with consumer spending by zip code using this credit card data. So the world's changing quite a bit. The government's a bit behind it. They're trying to use it, but there's a lot of new data out there and new data sources that are giving us a uh, more of a precise and a more frequent look at what's happening in the economy and ultimately over time should help with making a better policy and better investment choices. I have a two-parter for you. Um, you're incredibly passionate about what you do. So what, like, what's your motivation? What's your inspiration? What's your drive? So what do you do? Um, huh. Far away, please. I'm curious. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I have this like idiot's ability to convince myself that whatever I'm doing at the time is the most important thing in the world. Um, and I, I don't quite know how I do that, but but I, I I truly think that if I'm if you know if if it's a story I'm working on, there's nothing more important than what than, than what I'm doing right now, and and the fate of the world hangs on it. Um, mm. So I got to be a little careful with that. But but at the end of the day, um, I wake up energized. I think what I do matters. I I, I know that like J P Morgan and has a whole bunch of economists and. Citibank has a whole bunch of economists and, and Wells Fargo does. But I go on TV and I'm kind of like the in-house economist for a lot of small shops and a lot of individual investors. And they kind of rely upon me. So um, I, I, I think what I do is, is, is significant. And I have, you know, I really think it's important that I get it right mm -hmm. and as fast as I possibly can. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm motivated to get up every day. And I have been for something like 20 years at CNBC and, and eight years at the Wall Street Journal before that. That's incredible. Um, and my second part question, um, do you think that this form of extended 
quantitative easing is destructive for global markets long term. Ian, what huh. are you watching? The Animal Channel? I see, like, huh. I know. I, I, he had he had, he had flamingos oh, yeah. before. He had a bobcat. I've been watching <laughs> like a it. It's like a no, joy. Trying we're, to keep the retention rates up. Yeah, no, no. We're, we're writing down all the animals yeah. that have appeared. <laughs> we're up to a peacock now. I was watching the, the peacock. No <laughs> mating, though. No, no. no that was that Even was fun. You, you should leave it on. It's kind of like, you know. If people aren't interested in my answer, they can at least watch the animal channel behind it. <laughs> um, but um, I, the way I'd answer your question is, I think that the Fed intervening in markets and and being so involved and, and, and jumping in so much, I think it's distorting markets. I think that it's, it's, like, it's like anything. You know, getting in is easy, getting out is tough. I mean... Um, the, the, the Fed just got out too late this time. It probably got out too late before that. Then again, I think the getting in was right. Like in 08 and 09, I think that they, you know, probably saved the world from a terrible, terrible meltdown, you know? Um, but I think they probably hung around too long. Um, and then, and I think they didn't reverse policy quick enough. Um, and then this time around, they got in, I think, you know, it, Whatever you want to complain about what the government did in the pandemic or what the Fed did, it's you should remember this. When this pandemic hit, the debate we were having in economic circles was whether or not the unemployment rate was going to be worse than the Great Depression or equal to it. True. So I'm saying that by reminding folks that um, uh, they helped avoid a much worse situation than we could have had. The economy didn't crash or came back very quickly from where it was. Um, employment levels started coming back. Questions about whether or not you know we had these different waves come through, um, and 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 also well to point out from the Federal Reserve standpoint, they began thinking that the pandemic was going to hurt demand. It was going to hurt consumers. They didn't think that the government was going to come in with as much assistance as they did. The government almost is always too late with everything. This time around, they were not. There was bipartisan consensus. Democrats and Republicans got together, put money in people's pockets. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that uh, Biden gets all the blame for the $1.9 trillion that he put in, but Trump put in $6 trillion or, or $5 trillion. So the blame ought to be shared, is my point, on both sides. Um, uh, you know, I think Biden could have been a little more, uh, um, a, a little smaller and more direct with what he did that being the case i think the fed could have also backed off so yeah it's d i think you ask a great question it is destabilizing the fed is in in a big way and then the reason is because they have to come out and the and and the getting out is what's going to be a complicated situation and and you should tell people that what the fed is doing now it came in it was buying 120 billion a month now it's going to let 95 billion dollars a month roll off its balance sheet, and that's going to kind of disappear. So far, so good with that process, but it's a little uncertain how it all ends up. So let me ask you this as far as, um, you know, people, there's always doomsday scenarios and people saying a global depression, recession, prolonged recession, prolonged bear market, doomsday. What's the what's the worst that you think that, that <laughs> this, this, this situation can get? <laughs> You know, Art Cashin has a great comment. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this before, but he goes, the end of the world happens only once. It's a trade you have to time very carefully. <laughs> um, I, I've made a career of, of telling people this is not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think the world's going to go on. I think America will remain uh, one of the strongest economies in the world. And I think what Ian was saying was really interesting, talking about the companies. And, and I think what your, your criticism is right, but, but we have the best companies, yeah, you know? So. We got Google, we got Apple, we got all the companies that are technologically leading the world. They're the ones that you want to have. I mean, put it this way. I don't see as good companies that other, in other countries as I do in America. Those companies can and should and will do better. We got Tesla yeah. here in America. We got Facebook. Maybe, we got Meta. We got Meta. We got Meta. <laughs> Alpha. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got. We got. You know, you can name your favorite ones, but there are companies. This is where the innovation is taking place, which is why 
I'm going to just get on my high horse for a second. <laughs> the thing that bugs me the most is this story about immigration. We, we have to keep our borders open and immigration numbers up. We have to do what we've been doing, which is to attract the best talent from around the world. Yeah. And beginning with Donald Trump, and continue to some extent by the Biden administration, but they've eased off it. We brought down the legal immigration numbers and we need to bring those back up. Um, th there's a study that I just read that, you know, you talk about the idea, well, where all the workers go? Why do we have this, this, this issue? There's maybe one and a quarter to one and a half fewer mil million fewer immigrants in this country than would have been here if we were on a 2017 trajectory. And one of the reasons why America leads in all these places is we attract the smartest people from all over the world. They want to come here. And we need to make sure that's the case. They come here. They come to our universities. They stay. It's why America leads in patents around the world, why we have the most patents um, and, and, and the most uh, innovation. Um, so it's the one issue that I think we need to be thinking hard about which is, yes, let's help America the extent we can, but keep our borders open because that helps America too. And when I say keep our borders open, I want to say trade, keep trade open and keep the flow of legal people coming into the country. Hmm. So Chatty went doomsday. I'll, I'll go with the term that people have thrown around, economists have thrown around, and that's a soft landing, right? There's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's two... There's two uh, ends of the pendulum, right? It's either we're driving into a recession or there's a soft landing. Can you just explain what a soft landing is in the, the best way possible for, for our audience? Tale. <laughs> cool. I, I, I guess I didn't answer, Troy, your doomsday question, did I? Well, I, but that was, a, yeah. I, I mean, you can answer both if, if you'd like. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily a doomsday guy. I have a hard time going there in my head. Maybe I'm too optimistic at the end of the day. and But I, I just have a, uh, okay, so... I'll answer this question, which is the soft landing is the Fed raises rates, inflation starts to come down, and all we get out of that is a modest decline in growth, maybe a little bit negative, but really around between zero and one percent. And the unemployment rate goes up, I don't know, a percentage point, not that much. That would be a soft landing. Then you get inflation out of the system. The Fed can pivot, begin to reduce rates, and we're kind of off to the races to where we were before in terms of uh, having a, 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 a stock market that can trade on earnings and not these big macro things by the Fed. That would be a soft landing. A hard landing is the question that Ian was asking earlier. The Fed has to hike rates six, six and a half percent. You have a, a, a strong recession, a big decline in multiples in the stock market. And a big, uh, a big, a big sell-off. That would be the thing. That would be a hard landing and a huge jump in the unemployment rate, um, and a big decline, a big contraction in the economy where the economy gets smaller. What's your favorite Grateful Dead song? <laughs> Come on, talk to me. Let's get that's to the, it. That's the real yeah, question. Yeah, get to that. <laughs> um, so probably Terrapin Station. Um, if it was the song that when I was sixteen, I said if I learn how to play this. I learned how to play guitar, um, but I, of course I learned how to play it, and I still have a lot to learn on the guitar. But um, yeah, that's probably my favorite song. And you got to give them context, man. Um, I, I play in a Grateful Dead band in the New York area. I play pretty seriously. I'm going to be teaching um, at, uh, at at Rock and Roll Camp coming up at uh, the Brooklyn Bowl. Going to be playing with Phil Lesh a little bit. And uh, if incredible. you guys want to check out the Stella Blues Band, if you like the Grateful Dead, um, <laughs> we play. Uh, uh, almost every song they've ever played. There you have it. And he's great at it. Before we leave, I got to ask you a question. Um, we are in a midterm year. The midterm election is coming up. Um, so historically, I I'm sure you probably heard it when we were talking about it before, but historically, yeah. midterm election years um, have been very positive for the stock market. October specifically has been a very positive month for stock market midterm election years from October to April has been the best for any presidential cycle um, historically. So do you think that the midterm election, this cycle will hold true to that or, um, or will this year be different because of a variety of different things that we're going through? Well, 
you know, I was I was looking that up before, and and I I can't I can't do the 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 stuff on the midterm election. I, I completely uh, 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 take what you're saying. It makes sense to me. I will say that um, there's a lot of weird stuff happening this year. You know, that said, we've come off a long way. I have a running thing of how much we're down from the top. Do you guys have that number? Is it is it? It was thirty percent before today. I think right from that we S- were down off the top. S and P or the Dow. S and P. Yeah, it was uh forty eight hundred, and now we we we're at thirty six hundred now, roughly. Yeah, I think like twenty six, twenty seven percent, twenty twenty seven. Yeah, twenty seven. Yeah. Close enough for rock and roll, as we like to say. <laughs> Our guitars. Dow um, down twenty two. Yeah. So how much? How much is the Dow down? What percentage? I think twenty two percent. Nasdaq is at, I believe, thirty four. Yeah. Yeah. So so we've come off a long way. It, so look, I, I have to warn you. Everybody at CNBC does stocks except for me. I do all the other stuff. I'm like the janitor, you know. I I do the the windows and the toilets and stuff. When every anything's weird like fixed income stuff or derivatives, that's the stuff I do. So I let everybody else do stocks, and I do the macro stuff, and they can all figure their probabilities off of that. I hope this helped a little bit. But in any event, um, uh, I, I could see that you can play around plus or minus, well, plus five or ten percent on the upside. Just because we've come such a long way off, and I have to think the market is beginning to be in a place where it's priced in some worst case scenarios, taking a lot of the froth off the top, um, and 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 really baked in the idea that the Fed is going further. I think that's something the market ha- has has come around to believing, and there was a lot of rejection of that for a long time. I'd get on and I'd say, "Look, the Fed is going higher." And people would say, no, it's not. And I even got a note from somebody, you know, a pretty well-known name in the industry said, the Fed hasn't realized yet that it's not going to do what it says it's going to do. I'm like, okay, that may be the case. But right now, I don't think it pays for you to fight the Fed. That said, we have adjusted. The market will come to some form of equilibrium with what is going to happen with the current forecast. And it'll probably go a little bit further than that in that I think, you know, you if, if you're a dog on a leash and the guy keeps pulling you back every time you switch that leash, at some point you're going to say, you know what, I'm not going to pull on the leash anymore. Of course, my dog doesn't learn that yet, but I'm hoping that's <laughs> the case sometime soon. In any event, you keep getting whacked uh, uh, by, by being optimistic. Some point you're going to come back. So I could see that the market might be at some equilibrium where it's beginning to or it has begun or already Um, internalize what the Federal Reserve is going to do. And that whole analysis that I'm sure you guys talk about, which is, should I buy a stock or should I buy a bond at a risk-free rate, right? Remember now, what did we talk about earlier? You can go and you can get, I'll tell you what you get, you get for 10-year money, you can get 3.67% risk-free from the U.S. government. So that whole, whatever you call it, um, uh, 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 trade off that you have to figure out. Well, it's now a new world. Before that bond was trading at 0.25%, and it was a no brainer to buy stocks. It's not a no brainer anymore, but the market's adjusted for that. I think, you know, all you guys were asking the right question, which is if a recession hits, we'll probably get another 10% clip down, I would think, in earnings. And the market may not have adjusted. For a strong recession, but I do think it's adjusted for where the Fed is going at this point, point. Um, and that's, I guess, potentially some upside. If we can get some stability here, which I think is really important, we just went through this huge shock of England, you know, and then they came back the other day and things normalized a little bit. Um, so I'm kind of hopeful in that regard. Yeah, there's been plenty of talk about. Earnings. Um, and I'm glad you just said the word earnings because you know, a lot of times yeah. we tell people be careful when trying to trade on earnings because we can see a company like Apple have a hundred billion dollar quarter and the next day the stock goes down by two to four <laughs> percent. But the, the, there's been a lot of talk about earnings, particularly going into obviously we're in the fourth quarter, but the earnings from the third quarter, right? For the first two, we've seen growth in a lot of companies. But there's a lot of a lot of you know speculation that this will be an indication of where the market is right now. Can you talk about the importance of the third quarter's reports? Um, 
I, I think it's going to be really important. I think I think the guidance. So what I do with earnings is something different from what you guys do. You guys do earnings to see where stocks are going, valuations. I listen for the earnings for economic information. That's mm. how I listen to it. I want to hear are companies hiring or firing? Are they cutting back on expenses? Are they cutting back or going forward with investments? And of course, what their outlook is. I listen to the uh, consumer reports, um, the consumer uh, staples for what they're saying about the consumer and the health of the consumer. So I do a lot of work with the earnings stuff to hear what they're saying about the economy because it's kind of like, you know, frontline stuff. You know, these guys are have they, they have direct, direct um, uh, contact with, 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 with the information and the data that I'm trying to figure out. Um, it's a debate that, I don't know that I have a strong opinion about, but but I do think that the market, if the bond market is in part incorporating a recession into its own thinking, I think it's fair to say the stock market probably has that in there somewhere too. I think that if we had a recession where GDP declined by 2%, I don't think the stock market would be surprised by that. And I don't think that the earnings that would result from that 2% contraction would be that much of a surprise. In other words, the markdown in earnings. So I think there's going to be some markdowns that are coming. It's very important right now uh, as we come in, the, 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 these third quarter earnings are also going to set us up for the Christmas season, which, of course, is very important for retailers and the broader economy. Um, so I'll be listening real closely. It's very significant to follow it. But be a little careful because um, one of the things that people do is they they jump off of a, a big company's earnings and and they make conclusions about the whole economy or yeah. the whole or the whole market or the whole sector from a single company. You know, FedEx did badly, but what did that mean for UPS? You know, everybody wanted to say the whole world was going to hell in a handbasket because <laughs> FedEx's earnings were bad. That wasn't necessarily true. Walmart can have a bad quarter, maybe it overordered, but that doesn't mean Costco is also. So um, gather all the information, look at the macro data, and then look at the individual data uh, from the companies. Um, uh, that, that'll give you a, a fuller picture of what's happening. Just be a little careful to jump off of, the market likes to do that. The market likes to jump off of Walmart and say, the whole economy sucks, or the whole economy is great. It likes to jump off of Apple. Of course, these marquee companies do help us out a lot. But sometimes the story is specific to the company. Um, my final question for you. Uh, what is the greatest piece of advice that you've received personally and professionally? Hmm. So I want to say professionally, it was work for good people at whatever price, whatever price they want to give you, work for good people. Um, and that's something that's been it's it, it, it it's um it served me well my whole life. That's a good one. You know, I went down to Florida and became a reporter at a small newspaper because there was a really good editor there, and then I moved to a bigger newspaper. There's a really good editor there, so always work for good people. Um, you know, professionally, um, somebody asked me earlier um, uh, about books that I read and. Have you guys ever read this book, Against the Gods, by Peter Bernstein? It's The Remarkable History of Risk. No. It's a really cool book. And I don't know that there's professional investment advice in it, but it explains risk and explains how mankind learned to sort of calculate it and think about it. Because I don't think enough people incorporate risk assessment into their investment. like. When something is going to return 20% versus something returning 10%, why is that 20% um, uh, out there? Well, mm. you think that the market has adjusted for that risk, that 20%, it's a double return. Well, essentially because the risk is it's double. double. Yep. Um, so... If you read this book, it's a very entertaining book, and it's a really easy read. Um, and by the way, anything written by Peter Bernstein is fantastic. He wrote about gold, um, uh, and 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 that book has always stuck in my brain as something that said, 
okay, it's one thing to know what the return is on something, but another thing to do what's called risk-adjusted return. Um, and people need to think that through. We've talked about that tonight, the idea of assessing a stock versus the return in the, in, in the, in, in the, in, in the treasury market against the risk-free. Well, you know, you can go and get a mortgage bond and that will be a somewhat higher return, but is the risk well adjusted? And then you ask yourself this question. When I come to the table, what am I bringing in terms of my ability to assist that, assess that risk better or worse than the market has already done? Mm. So are you smarter than the market because you know something? Like, for example, let's say, you know, um, a, a sweatshirt that has assets over liabilities is selling for, you know, for 10 bucks out there. And all of a sudden they're out there for five bucks. Well, wait a second. Do you know you can sell those for 10 bucks or has the market made the right choice? And the bigger question is, am I going to get one of those sweatshirts from having been on this show? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Welcome to alumni. Yes, yes. <laughs> I really like them. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, that was you know somebody just quoted some that 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 you know it's like all these companies, um, Pelotons and those things. What, what were they thinking that the world was gonna was always gonna be indoors and there was gonna be you know go to the moon with with selling Peloton and that kind of stuff. No I way. Mean, you could see that crash coming from a mile away. I was sort yeah. of surprised that that smarter people didn't prevail in that regard. Um, the, the world was going to normalize eventually. I just don't understand why people priced it to be, you know, we were not going to stay indoors for the rest of our our, 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 our our living days. Even the people that stayed indoors weren't working out. They were using them as clothing racks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know they're partnering with Amazon and Hilton and <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never seen 50 people use a Peloton <laughs> at one time. So, yeah, <laughs> good point. Good point. Well, Steve, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Now you got to get up early for Squawk Box. But no, uh, I'm off. I'm off tomorrow. I'm, I, I took a few days off this week, but I said, no way. I'm not doing this. So I right. appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. And we definitely will have. The merch delivered to you. Uh, yes. Assorted Care colors. Care That's package sad. is on the way. It's on <laughs> no, the way. I only need one. I only need one, but I love it. Assets over liabilities. Very important. Very important. What, what, yeah. which, which color do you prefer, Steve? I, I like the blue a lot. The blue looks good. I, I don't think I'm going to wear it as good as you, but 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 it looks good. <laughs> we got I appreciate you. you. We got to sit down and have drinks, man. I appreciate you. You're one of my favorite voices on scene. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Great questions. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Appreciate Steve. it. Appreciate Talk you. Talk soon, guys. All, All right. right. Have a good night, man. Bye-bye. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Asymmetric risk to reward ratio is key. Inverted yield yeah. curve is key. Meta. Shout out to Steve, man. Shout, Shout out, out to Steve. Steve. Good, good. Good to a good conversation. Very um, like I said, it's like an economic class conversation. Very you know, um, high level conversation about microeconomics and the economy, but it's important mm -hmm. to know that stuff. And it's important to, you know, we talk about stocks every single week and investing and stuff like that, but it's important to know um, principles and metrics when it comes to the economy. If you're looking to be in not only an investor, but also in business, mm -hmm. this is something that, you know, business owners need to be aware of as well. So um, you know, key terms about the economy, jobs reports, inflation, Fed rates, different yeah. things in Asia is important. And it's, it's something that, you know, moves the needle. And uh, most people are just not really educated on it. Um, so, you know, it's something that I encourage everybody to to learn more about. And Steve is an expert in the, in the matter. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of those times where it's like an aha moment, right? And so a lot of us watch uh, economic shows and we're still lost. Like we know some things, like we can watch a ticket and we understand it. But some of the things he was talking about were just so spot on. It's like, this is one of those replays. Like I gotta, yeah, watch, you gotta watch this five shows. times. And now I could literally simultaneously watch it and watch what's on the program on the TV. It just makes perfect sense now. But I think something that's super interesting is like when he was talking about how he evaluates the economy, like it kind of went, he said, I look at consumer staples. 
And like last week mm-hmm. when we were talking about what should you be looking at in, in terms of a recession, look yeah. at consumer staples. They're going to tell you that a lot of them are safe plays because obviously in, inside of a recession or economic downturn, we're going to rely on the things that we know that we need. So that, that was like one of those key things. I'm like, ah, it just confirmed everything mm-hmm. that we have been saying from a brilliant, a brilliant mind. And part of the conversation he had with us at uh, Future Proof was even more of that. Like you can just feel yeah. like he loves to talk about this. He, yeah. he loves getting into spaces where he can actually talk about this. It, yeah. it becomes one of those things like I've worked for 30 years and nobody ever asked me, what do mm-hmm. I do? Um, but you can just feel his energy and he loves to teach it too. So that, that was dope, man. That was, yeah, that was dope. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that. Uh, the commonality between some of the best shows and best people, Mark Cuban, Peter, him tonight, Bonowin, Josh Brown, is like that inherent love it kind of like beams and radiates out of them. I pray everyone watching tonight, whatever your craft to call in is, you find a way to radiate um, in your career because it does definitely does have an impact because that is what's going to lead that kind of passion. Like he was out with us and then like Troy said, hey, I got to get up at four o'clock. And he was right about the day that he called it that night. Yep. Th- that was the day that the market fell a thousand points. Like passion is going to lead to your breakthrough so i don't want to go into sermon mode but yeah we looked at each other lead. he called yeah. that i said boy yeah. thank you for that lob thank <laughs> we were you like, wait how did how how does he you remember I'm when like... d-wade threw that joint to lebron, <laughs> LeBron? i was like oh baby thank you i appreciate it um everyone put in chat what was the biggest lesson you learned tonight even if you didn't understand some of the things he was covering please write this down global macro economic data first then fundamentals then technicals you have to know the global macro picture first to see what's going on. So in the, the 1980s, everyone thought Japan was going to be like the darling country, darling model for stocks and, and economy. Then that fell apart, never recovered. Um, even talking about the, the interest rates in Turkey, you have to know these things. So if you're new to the show, please go through every currency that is available. Um, kudos to you who got it on, on that British pound swing trade that I told you about last week. But go study every currency and go study every top 30 company in stock markets around the world. And if you come to Invest Fest in Europe, I will be exclusively covering the European market with trap and Australian markets to give you an edge, but you have to look at the entire market, inc- entire global landscape to be able to get an edge in the market. Yeah. Great episode, great yeah. episode. And we, and we got a new book to add to the list. So that's dope, Against against the God. Yeah, people. I gotta check that one out. Yeah, I gotta get that. Invest Fest Europe, the time has come. This is going to be a legendary weekend. Shout out mm-hmm. to my brother, Terrence J. Um, he will be doing a Halloween party mm. in London. That's part of the, the, the VIP package. Or if you're not a VIP, you can just come and just pay to be there. That's going to be on Sunday. We got the, the educational VIP on Sunday during the afternoon party at night. Royal Albert Hall on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um Wow. I got to bring like 14 outfits. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> At least. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and as he said, the, the pound, he was like, it's a perfect time to go. The pound is down. Absolutely. Um, flight prices have dropped dramatically. Hotel, Hotel prices, prices have dropped. You can get a, you can get a flight from New York to London for $700 round trip. Seven, 760 to be exact. First pretty, pretty affordable. <laughs> pretty affordable. That's really affordable. Yeah. So, um, Yes, make it there. Before we can we go some questions? Uh sure. Before we Just go to questions, I just want to um we have a uh, our app. Yeah, let's talk about that. Shout yeah, out to talk about it. Um we, we have we have an app in the app store, earn your leisure. We are officially we talk about Apple all the time. We are officially in the Apple app store. Mm-hmm. If you search earn your leisure, you will see our app is in the Apple App Store. Mm-hmm. And you can get the merch, you can get tickets to events, you can, you know, listen to the podcast, all everything mm-hmm. um in the palm of your hand. Yeah. So yeah, and and, and it's October. Uh so we want to, you know, recognize that it's breast can- breast cancer awareness month. So uh we have uh our breast cancer awareness uh merch that is on the site as well. And obviously, you know, portion of the proceeds uh goes to uh organizations that supports uh, research for breast cancer. So make sure that you cop that. I definitely will have that on for the rest of the month. My red and pink my, and my pink, that will be on for the rest of the month. So make sure you have to support that. 
Yeah, this orange went crazy. And um, yeah, Google fire. Play too. It's not just the Apple App Store, it's Google Play as well. I'm looking at Ian's screen. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, there listen I got a little strategy. <laughs> Very important. Yeah. Shout out so Alex we'll, and well we will go to questions for a, a bit. So usually uh, when we go to questions, we have Janet that facilitates the questions. And a few people asked where she was last week. So Janet has moved on. We wish her well. Um, she is taking a leap of faith on, on her own personal business. Yeah, that she's, she's started an entrepreneur. Yeah, she has a variety of different things. Yeah. So we wish her the best. Congrats to Jan. Um, yeah, Jan have, got a big plan. We appreciate her service, <laughs> her time at EYL University. It was uh very um tremendous. Yeah, a staple. Yes, yeah. for sure. And um, you know, added a lot to the conversation. So good luck and Godspeed to Janet. For now, we will have Troy as the replacement, oh, yeah. and uh, we may be we may be doing auditions, <laughs> casting call. Damn man, casting be prepared call. to sign a five year. I lost my job in three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> said, "Congrats, Troy, boy." Damn. All right, let's see, let's see what we got, man. John Ricker, we coming to you. I'm my yourself. guy. Been unmuted. What's going on? What's going on? How you doing? Hey, thank good. How you, I've man? Never been better. Y'all good? Yeah, I'm no, good, we man. Great, man. We great. Glad to hear yeah. your voice. Thank you, man. I think it's my first time on here. Hey, welcome. Long time, first time caller. Y'all listen to Dan Patrick. I got one seventy. That's that's uh, in the weeds. Um, I wanted to ask y'all about when you were on the floor. Mm. Um, Ian, you were saying like your journey was like nine years, and obviously you trying to shot you got your um pads as well so i was wondering while you're on the floor what kind of insights mm. or what was confirmed for you while you're there and what what did you learn like you have to learn more of well, Ian, you just went back so he was there yeah. twice in two weeks so what would anything different this time um yes uh for me uh you have to have your core strategy but one thing i learned this time so kudos to everybody had a chance to meet with again um you have to one thing i saw peter do he went to every trader on the floor and peter's a ball of energy like just ball of joy right just being around i notice every day though he's asking one person at every firm what is their insight and what's their strategy not to replace what he's doing but to add to so the day that we were there together um, right before the open, he was like, hey, what do you think? I put up the ES, I put up the SPY, SPX, call prices. You know, crystal ball is going crystal ball. But I noticed him go to every person and his brain turned about how he can add the insight and information that he got from that person and put it into his system. So for me, it's just to continuously add a little bit of, and we've seen athletes do it, like LeBron picked up the three after, you know, Golden State destroyed him that one time. Um, just to add things to your bag so you will be the most indispensable person um, in investing. That that would be my top list. And I have like 50 more I can go through. But yeah, I there, about there's that. a bunch. There's a bunch. Um, I, I mean, we spoke about the one. I, I think Trav and myself, we spoke about being in the, the, the floor and, and watching all the stuff that we didn't know. And it was just like, mm -hmm. it was encouraging. It was like, yo, there's still so much more we can learn. I think that was dope. I think the thing, um, and I didn't speak about this, but watching Peter move around the room and not just because of who he is and how long he's been there, but in the sense of he really has a plan when it comes to trading. Like I, I, he's walking us around for like three hours. And doesn't deviate. And he, he didn't move. And he's like, don't worry, guys. Like I don't start trading again until like 1.30. I only trade at these times. And I was just like, damn, like he's really has a plan and he's not budging on it. So he can show us around. He can give Ian a tour. He can give us all a tour. He knows from 930 to like 935, he's doing something. And then he's not doing anything again till 130 to two. And it was like, damn, like if we all had that level of patience, he could do everything else, have an interview outside, come back in, grab something to eat, get a coffee thing. and still know like, all right, it's time to go back into work. Uh -huh. Like that level of focus and that level of having a strategic plan Super impressive, super impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it was also cool to see them, um, the process of the IPO, 
because it was like literally we got to see it like they're debating on the price before it opened up they're just debating on the price and the ceo of the company is like right there so they were kind of like going back and forth on what the company was going to open up at and whether it was going to be twenty dollars or twenty dollars and five cents twenty dollars and thirty cents so you know that took a couple of hours for it, for them to actually settle on you know a, a price and I was coming from, you know, the wire houses and different things of that nature. So they were sending the orders in and they were kind of like, you know, debating about it and saying like, this is what it is. This is what we think is going to come in. So that was kind of cool just to kind of actually see that process happen in real time. Because like when we saw it with Facebook and a lot of other these IPOs, it was turmoil and rocky. And it was like yeah. three hour delay. And like, you're just wondering what was taking so long for it to actually come to the market. We got to actually see the process. Like they actually have to agree. Mm-hmm. on the price before they can actually put it out and um you know it's not something that just happens very quickly it takes time for them to actually come to that mm-hmm. level of agreement so that was interesting to see as well yeah and i at one point just just sheer size that is being traded i won't share you know the confidential stuff but to be able to like get a chance to go to the bloomberg and see all the power that's there oh my god um and then just size of contracts being traded on the option side and future mm-hmm. side so like six thousand contracts being traded in <laughs> so i'm looking at for my targets for futures i'm like that would be a 600 to eight hundred thousand dollar in a day trade like to see that kind of volume go through then that's just one trade some traders are doing 14 15 trades in a day stay only thing I can say is just stay dedicated to your process. Um, big wins are going to come. Big wins are going to come. Gosh, gotcha. appreciate y'all. You know, I said this to you before, and Rashad, I said this to you at Future Proof, but um, I want to say it out loud on here for people. Y'all really have, like, changed my trajectory in life. I think one thing y'all, I want to say this, too, is, like, you give people, like, a vision that maybe for a lot of people wasn't reachable before for, like, just as a life dreams and, and goals um so i want to say thank thank y'all for that appreciate, appreciate you john appreciate thanks that. for being thank an amazing you. person love is love appreciate bro it. thank you brother all right let's do this let's go to rodney oh rodney oh we are coming to you uh um, mute yourself you've been unmuted what's going on rodney oh i didn't even have a question fellas i just wanted to say thank you for everything you're doing and you know I'm here, I'm here listening. I'm here soaking up all this knowledge. So I really appreciate everything you guys been doing. I appreciate you, you right? Where you from, What's man? Yeah. Uh, Jersey, Jersey City. Hey. Yeah. I've been following you guys for a while. So, you know, man, uh, you know, just soaking up everything you guys been teaching. So appreciate what, everything. What, what, what's the biggest thing we can do to help you? Since you don't have a question, I'm actually one. Uh, I mean, right now I'm still a new investor, you know, uh, what kind of a new investor? Um, I got a couple of different uh, stocks I've been holding, which actually, let me thank let me you. you right now because I'm holding some stuff. Let's I'm get to it. Like, He's getting in the portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I got some of these like I invested in like during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to hear people talk about like, just see like what people are buying and, you know, this and that. So I invested in Clorox and it's not well, doing... What's the ticker? Uh, CLX. Oh, Clorox. Okay. Yeah. So I got in at around, my average cost is around 216. Mm-hmm. And right now it's down, it's down like crazy right now. It'd be a good time to, if you, if you believe in it, it'd be a good time to dollar cost average. Now here's the great part about this recession, different than 2020, okay. everything's down. So you don't feel like, damn, my friends are killing in Doge and yeah. Apple and I'm just losing. Um, If you need a price for Clorox, if it gets down to like $93.68, you can average in there. That'll bring your cost basis down. Um, okay. In about two years, it should be back above 174 and it should be smooth sailing. Yeah, it, it, it had a nice run, um, even prior to the pandemic. Um, okay. Obviously, things got, you know, valuations went higher, you know, obviously for the demand going up with those products. But yeah, not, yeah. not, a, bad, not a bad chart. Yeah. Yeah, Clorox is actually just where it was pre-pandemic so it's like in the same yeah. range of where it was so that yeah if you average down you'll be fine awesome um i also have moderna what I got dra- uh moderna i'm in at 
Uh, what's the 75 to, to add to it if we're going to get back in it? What's the 75 flat? 75? Yeah. I heard DraftKings. I'll let Troy take that one. <laughs> but Troy, I got your back. I'm going to set the screen for you. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> that's one I feel like I should have been cut a long time ago, but I've just been I, hoping. I, I'm with you. I still – I didn't, though. I didn't. I didn't. I still I still have – uh. I still have shares. I still have shares. I, okay. I, not as many. Not as many as I used to. Um, yeah. And I've I've learned. I've learned. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know what? Even when you you believe in it, um, mm -hmm. the the numbers, the numbers, and the analytics and the fundamentals, sometimes don't always add up the same way. But I still yeah. have shares. I still have shares. In okay. that case. No, I ha haven't done any options on that yeah. since. But, but, but can, can we be honest? Can everyone please write this down? Your first loss that hurts you really bad is going to shape you to be a better investor. Yeah, Same thing like when you go through heartbreak. Like when you get turned down the first time and like, you know, you go like walk and approach a girl. I'm like, hey, baby girl, I like you. And she like, get out of my face. You a munch, right? You like, let me step my game up. I'm a munch. So DraftKings so is a munch. You. Thought I was feeling you, right? It's over with. You got to rebound, regroup, recalibrate, and then everything going to be good. So we, and especially as traders, we always lose. I was telling uh, my guy yesterday, in a winning trade, you didn't have on enough size. In a losing trade, you had on too much. From every investment that you make, the ones that hurt you, they're going to make you a great investor. So that big, thick book of rules that I have, it came from me getting my ass kicked. So yeah. um, don't, don't feel bad about the losses that you're taking right now. They're going to pay yeah. a healthy dividend later. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm gonna try to stick to that uh two two tech two index you talk about a lot. So I'm gonna definitely Thank yeah. Thank you, man. But I appreciate, appreciate you. Much. Appreciate, I appreciate it, you, Rock. Have a good one. Thank you. Shout out to Jersey City. That's that's a uh, home of Joe Button. Shout Jersey out to Joe. Home. Maybe November 27th, Joseph will be there. Hey Joseph. You never know. You never know. All right, let's, let's never why, know. Why did, what, let's do one more. What's up with the Kanye <laughs> um White Lives Matter situation? Um, wait, I what? Think that was, yeah, he wore the shirt. Yeah, Kim back. That's what it was. <laughs> him, and, him and Candace. He went to Paris Fashion Week with uh, um, what's her name? Candace Owens. Candace Owens, and they had um white oh, lives. Oh, you ain't see it? Yeah, I saw no, I'm, I'm, I'm done with yeah. Kanye, yo. But then they had the Pope. They had the Pope on the front. Yeah, I didn't see. I, I can't read what the writing. I was said. trying to figure out who the other face was. I couldn't quite see it. It was the Pope on the front, and then on the back it said "White Lives Matter." Yeah, I saw my son put up a whole post about it. And he was just saying like, attention is one of the most deadliest drugs in the world. But I'm just trying to see what's what's the what, what was his angle with this? Oh no, Did he he didn't say his angle. He didn't speak on it. See, yet. I know I don't know if it's part of the the, the season nine Yeezy uh, fashion line release. I know that's the show was for why he wore it and was with her. That I don't know. He didn't speak on it. I'm sure somebody's gonna ask him about it, which probably is why he wore it. I I, I missed the old Kanye. You gotta go back to Chicago. Like, remember when you sold them beats to Jay that payroll had, and you had that pressure on you? I believe Jay. He told me, "Yo, we leaving that red cat. We going home." He told he told that to to Donda. We I just want to know. I just want to know what. I just want to know what the science behind that was. I'm just I'm just curious to know. I'm just nah. curious to know. And then he gonna complain about getting robbed, and then do that. You signed your rights away, fam. And another thing. Ari Spears, I love you, brother. <laughs> but please stop. What's he's he, at it again? What, what do he do? But with like, the the Steve Harvey slander on Vlad, talking about like Steve not a great business person. And oh no no no, we that's only because no 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 no, we never went to see that. He he said Steve Harvey's not a great business. Bro, like, I, I see, see this is Ian Dunlap in the Red Panda Rebellion. Yeah. I know a lot of people in Hollywood that have five shows that didn't get rich. We not doing that. Just because you messed up and you did that skit, don't. Yeah, he got caught in this this the the Tiffany Haddish thing, right? Well, I don't, I don't, I didn't. Why would they even? Why would they even talk about that? I don't know. I ain't see it. I can't speak on it. And areas you're talented, but talent is not enough. You only get what you negotiate. If you're not negotiating for equity and royalties and perpetuity, and for non-talent contracts as an executive, you will not get what you want. Talent means nothing. Yeah. And then we go back to Animal Planet, yeah, sponsored man. by Ally. Somebody said they want to know what channel is. They they need uh, something to go to sleep to tonight. This is uh, <laughs> HBO Max, Planet Life Two. This is not an ad, but that's fire. Yo, Reese, you know. what's going on? We are coming to you. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted, Reese. What's the deal? Where you from? What's going on, gentlemen? How y'all doing? How you doing? Good. Good. How you doing? 
I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I am hey. a recovering Forex trader. And I say recovering because I, I had some gnarly losses back in 2020. We and so lose, <laughs> it's okay. But you're a trader. Yes, That's sir. Fine. So uh, I really just wanted to kind of get some advice as far as like getting back into the field um, and really more on like question on brokers and what do you guys recommend? Because I'm still, I got a little bit of um, anxiety from Robin Hood. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what I should be doing as far as the foundation of steps. And as terms of long-term investing or trading? Trading. Okay. So um, do you still have access to MT4 or no? I do. I do. Okay, so if you can do that. So, okay, this is a talk I've been wanting to have for a long time, and I'm going to keep it really short. It's like 12 steps, but I'm going to go through three. So after we go through like a tragedy with trading, right, it's almost hard to even open up the platform. 100%. You, number one, you have to meditate before and while trading, first and foremost. So that's why I normally have like scenic things like this. Because if I, when I was like listening to Rick Ross and Gucci, I'd be too excited getting the trade the wrong way and be like, damn, Ross, why you make me lose? It wasn't Ross' fault. It was my fault. So number one, I need you to meditate. Number two, go to a different platform. So then you can program your brain to have a fresh start at a different um, platform so you do not have the emotional negative attachments that you did on Robinhood or whatever platform you lost on before. And thirdly, you have to promise that you're only going to take one trade per month. Now as a trader, that sounds like foolishness. I know. Here's why. If you get back in the saddle and you're taking five to six trades a month, it's going to trigger those bad habits, bad experiences that were there before. And if I put you on a Euro USD right now on a one hour and I was like, yo, if you win this trade, I'm going to give you 50 grand. You would knock that trade out of the park. 15 trades in? I don't know. And then it goes back to what Troy said about Peter. I'm watching Peter's process. I'm asking them all kinds of questions behind the scenes. Hey, what, what would you do in 1987 when Paul Tudor Jones made 22% and da, da, da. He's like, hey, my process is my process. So whatever your trading plan is, you have to stick to. But the number one thing that hurts most traders like you and I is when we start over trading, we think taking more trades is going to make up for the losses that we endured when we actually need to do less. And when we get to a baseline back to consistently winning, then you can ramp up your trades. There you have it. You have it. There you have it, ladies and Detroit, gentlemen. Detroit, what up, though? Market Mondays, another legendary situation. Absolutely. Um, as always. You know what we forgot to shout out? I TikTok. At nah, CLF, the cultural leadership fund. Shout out to Chris Lyons. Uh, shout out to Megan Alexander. Who oh, yeah, that's fire. A, a guest on Market Mondays. We had an incredible uh, weekend with our good friends over there. Shout out to Eastside Golf. Uh, shout out to Steve Stout. Uh, hey. Shout out to Robert Smith. You might have heard of yes. him. Robert, Robert F. Smith. And Ben Horowitz. Yo, hey. you, you want to talk about salad? I had a whole conversation about hip hop with Ben Horowitz. Um, that That's was, legendary. Crazy. Brandon, <laughs> let me see some of the footage behind the scenes. No, no cameras allowed. No cameras allowed. <laughs> like the red panda belt boat. Put your cameras away. But yeah, put the hey, stick on hey, the camera. When you gotta put them away. Yeah. Yeah. Shout, just, out, shout out to Robert Smith. Just know we in room. We're kicking down doors for everybody to walk through. Just know that. That's a fact. History every every week, what you say, or every day? Every day? Every day? No, every gotcha. day. Every day. Don't do yeah. it. Uh, yeah. That's a good bar. To the end of the year. To the end of the year. We can't Market stop Mondays. There. Market Mondays live. Madison Square Garden. A night to remember, 1127. Coming mm -hmm. with bonuses. Next week, we'll announce some more, some more surprises. Let's announce some guests next week. Okay. I'm going to start. We're going to do the whack 100. We're going to Debo people. You said you was going to do this. <laughs> Roll it out. <laughs> anticipation. I got the receipts. The anticipation gotcha. is building for Market mm -hmm. Mondays Live. The anticipation is building for London. Cheerio. Yes. That's going to be a situation. I got to get a Halloween a costume. Are we doing like a, like a, like as a group we doing or are we just going to individual? How you want to play it? What do you mean? Like, you know, like, like, Some a, like Halloween like a thing? Team or something? Yeah, like we all come as 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 a similar thing. I think it'd be better if everybody came as an individual. I got like a few ideas. It's that more I creative. Yeah, it's yeah, more yeah. creative that gotcha. way. I got I got three ideas that I'm I'm thinking of. Um, Halloween in London. This is gonna be a legendary situation. It's gonna be a legendary party. Terrence J. That alone guy. equals legendary party. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Terrence, Terrence J. In London. 
Terrence J in London. Hopefully, good. It's a good thing Royal Albert Hall is at nighttime. Yeah. The next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll... Get some sleep. <laughs> Get some. It's gonna be we have rehearsal night. though. We have rehearsal. Yeah, please. Rehearsal. Every... Rehearsal is mandatory. You must show up. It's an opera. No, I'm saying we we have rehearsal. It's yeah, a, I know. It's an opera house, so we have to get our acoustics. They have to. Um, it's mandatory rehearsal. I'm talking about for yeah. the people that are going to be speaking. It's mandatory. We got to show up. It's not yeah. speaking. It's performance. Performance. Absolutely. Performance. For the for the performers, the for the performers, we have uh walk through rehearsal, um, to make sure that the acoustics are up to. It's not at eight a.m. Is it? No, 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 no. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Good Lord. Like five heartbeats. Ah! Game time. <laughs> Game, Game time, time. folks. We want to let you know about a great choice if you're looking to bank or invest. Ally is a leading digital financial service company with passionate customer service, innovative financial solutions, and our relentlessly focus on doing it right for both customers and our communities. Yeah, with Ally, so you can save, invest, and spend on the things that matter most to you. Everything we need, we're all better off with an ally. Mm-hmm. What up, though? I love what it. Up, ally. Appreciate what you guys. Up, Kudos to everybody at Madison. Mark Zuckerberg, why don't you come to Madison Square? <laughs> While we're at it, Let's make oh, some oh. magic happen. Mark, I Zuckerberg. gotta get an executive from, from TikTok on here soon too. He is. He is from the town of Greenberg. Little known fact. Mark Zuckerberg, where does he live? California. Yeah, he, he's out in California. He is from Dobbs Ferry, New York, which sin, is sin, a village. Sin, and, is he sin, really? Yeah, yo, you saw his uh, little league card. Sold for like a hundred thousand dollars. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw there? that. Yeah, look Jeff, at the back. It that. says Dobbs Ferry, New York. Jeffrey Dahmer's glasses are sold for a hundred thousand dollars. What's the deal with that? That's wild, yo. Crazy. Yo, that's crazy. People is crazy, man. Why is there a show on that? Well, that's another story. People, crazy. yeah. That's you watch it? Topic for I did not watch it. I, I, I mean, I feel for the families that. Well, I heard that it. Well, actually, um, I didn't watch it, but I heard about it, and it actually, there was a lot of things that I didn't know. I didn't know it was a racial thing. I didn't know that yeah. he was black man, right? I didn't know that. I didn't know that he lived in a black neighborhood. Yeah. I didn't know that the cops that they was calling the cops for a long, long time and they didn't listen because they was black. I never really. I just knew he was eating people. I didn't know the racial dynamic. Um, because what was that? Ninety. That was early. That's all we knew. It was like, yo, he was he was kidnapping people, he was eating people. But, but what year was that? Late eighties, early nineties. Early nineties. Yeah, so yeah, I was like four years old, five years old. So I don't you know. I I don't really. I never knew the story. Um, that, so that part is interesting because I never, I never actually knew the story behind it. Yeah. From, from the, it, it was like homosexual black men was like the target, but all we knew, all I knew growing up was like, yeah, this guy was a mass murderer. He was killing people, storing them in his fridge. Like, just, just eating, crazy I knew, I knew stuff, bro. People. I knew he was a serial killer that was eating people. Yeah. But I didn't know. I didn't know the whole. Then he got murdered in jail. I, yeah. I heard yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, growing yeah. up in the Midwest, you heard these kind of crazy stories, and man, this is it. That's why another reason why, like, uh, I know we talked about the political landscape and things not being fair, but yeah, you target a lot of black men, uh, underserved communities. John Wayne Gacy, same way. Um, so please, please be careful. Please be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yes. Yeah. Before we go, before we go, I want to send uh, our condolences out to my, our brother Mike and Man, the entire McDonald family um, on their loss. Our thoughts and our prayers uh, go out to you. Obviously, you know that we love you all dearly. Any loss to 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 our brothers is a loss to us. So, Bam, Rich, Gary, uh, Danielle, yeah. Zay, Zuri, Jason, Jason. Yeah. Um, our thoughts are with y'all, uh, and uh, we'll we'll see you in a few days, man. Yeah, love us all. Yes. All right, guys. Take care. Um, We'll see you next week.